And Joe, if you could introduce our speaker, please. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. We have Dr. Ben A. Potter from the University of Alaska. And the title of his talk is Late Pleistocene Peopling of the Americas, Integrating Genetics and Archaeology. Dr. Ben, Dr. ben Potter is Professor of Anthropology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. His research interests include high latitude adaptations, inner site variability, site structure and organization, and long-term history. He leads investigations at important subarctic uh, sub sites, including Upward Sun River, Mead, Jersel River, and Delta River Overlook, and is currently engaged in archaeogenetics, geoarchaeology, and human ecology research directed at understanding the peopling of Northeast Asia, Beringia, and the Americas. I'm going to mute myself, and I want to have everybody give a warm welcome to Dr. Potter. It's all yours. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Stephen. I just want to double check. You guys can hear me okay? I think that's good. So I'll start the presentation. Um, thanks again for inviting me to speak with you uh, this evening um, on the people in the Americas. It's a, a really interesting topic, an important topic, and one that is rapidly changing. And hopefully my colleagues and I are, are contributing some of this uh, to some of this change. Um, certainly the literature is different than the archaeology most of us are used to, and so I've been tracking that sort of through time, and what you will see tonight will be the culmination, at least up to date, for what I think about the people in the Americas, the models I think that are going to be fruitful for us to evaluate with new data. Um, there certainly is a lot of debate, there's no question about it, um, and I want to encourage us to think about not just the Americas, but Northeast Asia too, because it's part of one process. Um, of getting humans that far north. And then once they're that far north, it's relatively easy to move them east or west across the same latitude because you're dealing with the same kinds of animals. Um, I do think that the genetic literature and the archaeological literature is coalescing, which is helpful for us. Um, if, it, if it was diverging, there would be a problem. Um, but it's coalescing, and it can allow for a number of different models to sort of accumulate or be derived, but I hope that today you'll view this as a plausible model, um, but a model nonetheless, but needs more testing. Um, so the field is really interesting. A lot of old ideas that used to be sort of uh, in stone, no pun intended, um, have been toppled, yet there really hasn't been a new consensus that has emerged, and this is important. We're, we're in a state of flux with respect to the people in the Americas. Um, but there are a couple of reasons I think this topic is really important beyond just you know, sort of interest of, of specialists. Um, one, high latitudes were really among the last to be colonized by modern humans, anatomically modern humans. And they pose uh, provo severe challenges to sort of our adaptive strategies, our innovations. And understanding how this occurred helps us investigate human adaptation at extreme environments. Second, the studies of ancient hunter-gatherers indicate they're really different than modern or recent foragers. They used sophisticated stone technology. They had low populations. They had very large territories and extremely high mobility. And as you and I, we all spent 99% of our time as a species, as a group of hunter-gatherers, it behooves us to understand um, this major adaptation. It allowed for migration into vast new territories and unfamiliar landscapes. Third, we find ourselves in the midst of climate change. Um, the last time that it warmed as rapidly as it's warming now was during the deglaciation period between 16 and 11,000 years ago. And that's the time that we see the colonization of the Americas happening. And so this is all important to help us understand sort of these, these broad patterns. So my research is in Eastern Beringia, and I focus on Paleo-Indian mobility technology and economics. And I'm gonna come at this from a Beringian perspective for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, we agree that the first Americans did expand through Beringia while en route to the Americas, south of the Aichis. Second, the region that I work in contains arguably the densest concentration of preserved ice age sites in the Americas. And it really does allow us to get control on things like seasonality, 
variation, female, male activity areas, things like that. And third, we know that they came through the region, the ancestors of Paleo-Indians. So to understand what baggage they had, what, what pre-adaptive strategies they had, we need to look at what they did up here. And finally, both routes, the coastal route and the ice free quarter route, are in the same region. So we need to understand them in that in that context. Um, so we're going to look at that today. So first, we want to talk about the archaeology. Um, so what you're looking at here is a discontinuity, to put it mildly. Um, when we look for early Paleo-Indian archaeology in the Americas, we see something like you'd see on the right here. So Clovis. Uh, Clovis technology is a good example of it. A lot of bifaces. You've got some organic technology, uh, you know, yeah. some blades. Dr. Dr. Potter, not to interrupt. Uh, could yeah. you share your screen? Oh, thank you. Sorry. I knew I missed something. Yep. <laughs> you, you're uh, going through a good introduction there, but. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So how is it now? Do you guys see it? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so you didn't miss much, guys. I just went from here to here to here. Okay. So sorry about that. So uh, what you're seeing here is a very uh, different kind of an archaeology. Um, on the Siberian side, you guys notice a number of things you won't find in the Americas um, south of the ice. Things like what I'm circling right here. This is a Gubetsu type wedge shaped microblade core. Um, you can see these flutes off the front. These are where You've got a prepared platform where tiny microblades, about, you know, say about a centimeter or less in width, are basically removed to be used as razor insets into composite weapons. Um, so this kind of technology we don't see in Clovis. Um, a number of blade technologies, um, like these uh, blade points or burins, we don't find as well. We do find pie faces. But the problem is everybody's been searching for a Paleo-Indian ancestor in East Asia and they've never found it. And the reason they haven't found it is because there has been change in the technology during this process. That's why we need to turn to something like genetics to give us a more firm understanding of its overall. So when considering the genetic data, there's, there's three kinds of data we could look at. Uh, we could look at empty DNA, here, uh, which you're getting unilinearly only along the female line. You can look at Y DNA, which is from the Y chromosome, which you're only getting along the male line. And really the genetic work from the, say the early to mid nineties up until about 2010 was of this variety. And so much of what you probably read about in the past have been using these methods. The problem, well, there's a number of problems. One, you will get a tree. It will be a tree. And if there are missing lineages, um, you're not going to retrieve them. Like all of these, all of these blanks here. Um, these are these are records. These are individuals you're not going to find data for with this kind of uh, genetic data. But most importantly, we know that populations admix. So they're they're once they split, they are interacting with other groups, right? They're exchanging genes. Y DNA and mtDNA cannot handle that at all. Okay. So autosomal DNA, this is DNA that you're inheriting in your autosomal DNA, so from your mother and your father and all of their previous ancestors. So there, it's a richer data set, many more uh, base pairs, um, a lot more you can do with it, and you can deal with things like later admixture. Um, the first individual with the full genome, uh, genomic analysis was in 2010. So that wasn't that long ago. And really over the last few years, um, autosomal DNA is where we're really getting more and more information from. I want you to keep these three in mind. This is why the last few years, say since 2018, we've really transformed what we understand about the people of America. And this gives you just a, a, a brief idea of what you can do with mtDNA. Um, there's about 15 haplogroups. groups. You can see them as these various colored uh, dots here, these various nodes. You're looking at time on the y-axis. 30,000, 25, 20,000, and this is recent here at the end. And these are the different haplogroups. These are just clusters of people that are related based on NT DNA. So uh, back in 20, 2007, they discovered, this was Tam et al., that the formation of these groups occurred really early. You can see this really early in time. You see this rapid diversification was only after 15,000. So there's a gap between when the genomes were formed when the populations were isolated, and then when they expanded. 
But that gap is what the standstill is all about. There was a period where they weren't getting admixed genes from Asia, but it's prior to their expansion into the Americas. So that, that's that's what this refers to. From the same paper, this is Lama Sadal 2016, we can get female effective population size. Here's looking at numbers of people on the on the axis here. And you can see there's an expansion. There's like a bottleneck here and an expansion somewhere after 16, 15,000 years or so ago. Hopefully you guys can all see that. So all of this data is telling us that this is the time period for a rapid, rapid diversification, a kind of like a star-like radiation of people probably entering the Americas. And so these are all Native American uh, genomes. So when we look at the Y DNA, we see the same thing. These are the various Y uh, DNA uh, haplogroups. Those are just uh, clades, if you will, sort of populations of people that have the similar genetic makeup. And you can see that they're forming quite a bit early, 19, 18,000 years ago. But you notice this strong diversification around basically 15 and a half and 14 and a half thousand years ago. That's the inference for this is the people of the Americas. Rapid, star-like, which means moving many different directions all at once, exactly what you'd expect to see from a colonizing population in an area, a vast landscape that didn't have people prior to that. So notice those time frames are relatively similar to each other, sometime between 15 and 14,000 um, roughly years ago. So this is all great. This is Y-DNA, MPDNA. So let's talk a little bit about the genomic data. Um, this was a shock to some of my colleagues. I, I showed a version of this slide um, a few weeks ago to professional colleagues, and they were like, wow, that's a whole lot in the last few years, COVID, right? This is the COVID period. It's like right here. So you could say that we, we were busy during, during the lockdowns, so to say. Um, the very first individual was genomically anal analyzed. This was the Sakak individual in Greenland, actually. It's a, a paleo Siberian individual. Um, and really the watershed year, we have uh, uh, in 2014, we have the very first, uh, this is Anzic, the first Native American. Uh, in 2018 was really the watershed year. Uh, Upward Sun River, uh, the individuals I, I was working on, the Yana individual, those were discovered. And there were two important papers that dealt with hundreds of samples in Asia and the Americas. Uh, one by Eski Villerslev's team out of Denmark and one out of David Reich's team out of Harvard. And since then, it's been exponential. This is just as of April, 2023, but already we have 10,000 ancient genomes, full genomes we can look at. In our part of the world, that translates to about 500 individuals. This is mind blowing in terms of each individual has a wealth of population data within that uh, that one genome. So it's unlike mtDNA and yDNA data. So myself, I'm an archeologist. Um, I do work with geneticists. I've published, these are a number of papers I've published with um, genetics colleagues. Um, this one right here was one where I was a co-lead author on a, a paper in Nature. Um, so my role as an archaeologist, obviously, is to obtain samples and permissions and working with indigenous groups, which I do uh, gladly over the, the three decades of my career. But also, it's to help organize hypothesis testing. Like, what should we be looking at? Uh, the geneticists may not know. They're not, they're not archaeologists. They're not privy to what you and I uh, understand about the record. Um, that we want to understand. Um, they're thinking in terms of lab tubes, uh, you know, test tubes, and, and um, individual samples. So we look at context, we look at the, the hypotheses to be tested, and we look at interpreting the results. Because the results aren't super easy to interpret. Uh, they might be, here's a split time, here's a time of admixture, and that's it. We need to understand the scope. Where could they be placed? What ecologically is happening? Um, what, how about this look like on the ground, per se? And that's some of what I do. Um, this one paper we published in Science Advances in 2018 with a number of geneticists, we kind of go through our differences, but some of the similarities in the way geneticists think about it um, and the way archaeologists think about it. So one is that we're pushing, you need multiple lines of evidence. Uh, you know, any good scientist is going to tell you this. Any one method is not going to be enough. You need to have them converge and you paint a, a more rigorous picture. Second, we should focus on where the archaeology and genetics are lining up to build strong hypotheses. And anchor points are a really big part of that. 
So in other words, this is a point where we know the date, we, we've dated the individual, we know the culture that they come from, the, the way the culture is related to other cultures, and we know the genetics, and how that genetic group is related to other genetic groups. Right now, we're I've, I've built a database uh, tracking this. We've got about 530 or so for Northeast Asia in the Americas. Uh, and then, of course, timing. So when do the lines diverge? When do we see expansions of populations? When does that work? Uh, and then finally, the context of multiple working hypotheses, which I'm a big fan of. Um, I'm definitely, I don't have my one idea that you know, this is the way it has to be. So even what I'm going to present to you today, it's just one, it's one working hypothesis that I'm fine if it's rejected, if we've got better data, but at least it seems to be the best that we've got at this point in time. Um, so I want to walk you through sort of a, a framework of thinking about these populations. It's going to be complex at the end. I, I, I apologize in advance, but I'm going to try to do it as simply as I can to help sort of um, orient everyone to the groups that we're going to be talking about. So we'll begin with a very simplified version. Okay, but before I get to that, so on the y-axis, we're dealing with uh, years before present. So here's present here, 2024 is roughly there. Uh, we'll go 40,000 years, that's all we need. 40, 000, anything beyond that, we're not dealing with sort of modern humans anymore. We're dealing with like Neanderthals and, and these events, which are super exciting, but don't play a role in the people in the Americas. Um, right here, you can see this blue uh, or white zone. This is the last glacial maximum. That's going to be an important element in the story. So the last period, the last stadial, very cold, very frigid, particularly in the far north, and most importantly, very dry. So this is going to drive biodiversity down. It's going to drive biomass down. It's not pleasant to be up here during the LGM. Okay, so we'll start with um, this. All modern and ancient Native Americans derived from a single founding population, one. And this is our paper in 2018 pointed this out. Um, and these are termed First Americans. So I'm going to, there's going to be uh, acronyms, I'm sorry, FAM. That means First Americans. We know that they diverged from East Asians, like the Han Chinese, uh, somewhere around 36,000 to about 25,000 years ago or so. So a long period of admixture, basically. After 25,000, they split. So in other words, two different populations, FAM and East Asians. Um, after that, we know that Native Americans are getting about 25% of their genes from a totally different population. And this, again, was from a 2018 paper. Uh, we turned these ancient North Eurasians, or A-N-E. These guys are living far to the north. Um, it's a very different group, and we know they're admixing with these first Americans somewhere between 44,000 and 20,000 years ago. Somewhere in that neck of the woods is when we've got that admixture. Uh, surprisingly, there is strong early structure among Native Americans and three basal groups. There's ancient Beringians, which remained in Alaska, um, and two groups of Native Americans, which are commonly misunderstood. Uh, NNA, or North Native Americans, and SNA, or South Native Americans. This does not mean North Americans and South Americans. It doesn't mean that at all. North Native, North Native Americans are only found in basically Canada North. Okay, so Dene people, Algonquian peoples, Salish and Waukesha, people like that. Um, and Navajo and Apache, people that came down recently, those were part of that Northern group. Every other Native American from basically Montana South through Central America, all the way into South America are SNA, Southern Native Americans. Important to keep that sort of distinction. So those are the three basal groups. In 20, also 2018, two different Siberian groups were identified for the first time. Um, this was Paleo-Siberians, who separated from Native Americans probably around 24,000 years ago or so. So a lot is happening during that LGM. You notice that. There's a lot happening during that cold period. Um, and later, these were replaced by Neo-Siberians, and these would be like Evian or Evian reindeer herd. Somewhere within the last thousand, two thousand years, a lot of Paleo-Siberian groups were replaced by these Neo-Siberians, and they're related to like modern uh, Han Chinese. Um, so they're they're very different. Um, later in the Holocene, there was another group um, that was impacting some NNA groups, and this is a big mystery. We don't know this group. We know they're Asian. We know they're Siberian of some kind. 
It could be a Paleo-Siberian group that we haven't, we, we don't know about because um, we don't have a sample, or it could be some people related to modern Korea, uh, which is a group in the in the in the far northwest, uh, sorry, northeast of, of Asia. We we simply don't know, um, but it happened somewhere during the Holocene. And then Palo Inuit, uh, which most of us would, would be thinking of um, Arctic small tools or Palo Eskimo ancestors. This was a Palo Siberian group that expanded much later into the Americas, around 4,000, 5,000 years ago. They don't come into the story here. And then finally, um, the Jamon, uh, you can see separated quite early on. Um, so the genetic analyses are great for doing this, creating trees, right? But they don't give us geographic locations. And the stars, what I just put up there, I'll do it again. The stars represent the very earliest individuals that we have actual human remains for. So we can actually track them in time. Um, we, you can see we have no ancient examples of first Americans older than about 12,800 years ago. So this is a big problem. We, we'd like to know where they were uh, during those early periods of time. Um, the critical period is after the LGM and then before this expansion into the Americas. Luckily, in the last few years, we've picked up a few of their close cousins. You can see them here, uh, Paleo-Siberian, very early Paleo-Siberians around 17,000 years ago. And that really helps us nail down where the Native Americans were likely present, the first Americans, during that standstill we talked about before. So these are anchor points that represent important elements that can help us build a model for the peopling of these regions. That's what I'm going to do now. Um, so I suspect some of you may have heard of ghost population. Um, some of you may have heard of something called population Y. That's the, the probably the, the one ghost population that has had the most, um, I guess, media interest in it. So what you're looking at here is um, uh, Skoglin et al. This is where they discovered this uh, not that long ago. Um, and it's a heat map. So these are modern populations. There's no ancient populations. So these are all modern groups. And it's a heat map. The closer to red you get, the more related they are. The closer to white, the less related they are. What you can see is there's a, a, a number of South American modern groups of Native Americans that are similar to some of the folks that we see now in, in Indonesia and New Guinea, so Melanesia area, uh, Australasian. And so there was hypothesized that here's another source. But I want to encourage you to resist the impulse to speculate as to you know, what could be going on with population Y for a couple of reasons. One, it has not been found in some of the earliest human remains that we have in the Americas, number one. Number two, it's at a very low detection level. It's a signal that I've, I've spoken with some geneticists that this could be a problem with our methods, and it may not be a real signal. Very weak, nonetheless. And then the third issue, which is the most important, is even if it is a real signal, there is no time frame for when the admixture could have occurred. So for instance, the ancestors of Native Americans, when they were hanging out, say, in Mongolia or northern China, they could have admixed with ancestors of these people and gotten those genes at that point prior to expanding into the Americas. The problem is there's no constraints as to when that mixture occurred. So it's effectively, it doesn't help us um, with the problem. Um, this does. This is the, the time constraints are going to be the most important important elements. The, the big question is when did people enter the Americas? When did Native Americans come across? And the most important um, time constraints are shown here. Uh, so again, we've got time. These are, these are all calendar years before present or calibrated years before present. I've kind of reversed the, the axis here. So here's 10,000 years ago at the top, 23,000 years ago at the bottom, and then a number of references if you guys want to sort of see where I pulled all this from. And basically, the mtDNA I've already talked about, there's an expansion of population somewhere between 16 and 13,000 years ago. Y-DNA is a little bit closer, but you can see it's the same time frame. Uh, so these are all of the Native Americans that entered the Americas, all three, NNA, SNA, and ancient Beringians. So the SNA-NNA split, it's very wide. It also doesn't help us. It's somewhere between 17 and 14,000. We don't know when. But these two things are important. And I think these are the most important constraints because SNA is the only genetic clade or, or group south of the ice sheet. Oh, am I still good? Am I still good? Okay, I heard an echo. It seems to be gone now. 
Okay. So uh, what SNA is important is that understanding the split times within SNA help us solidify when people were entering North America, south of the ice sheets, and South America. And so the, the splits that we have between North SNA groups and South SNA groups is somewhere between 15,000 and 13,000. Basically, the average is about 14,000 years ago. So that's a good indication for when people are coming into North America, so like California, you know, south of the ice sheets. The South versus Central American SNA is a good indication for when the first South American populations expanded. That was roughly 13,800 years ago. And I'm, I'm very happy with these results. They really coincide with the majority of the, the vast bulk of the archaeological data we have. So this, I think, is the this red box is the window for this expansion into the America. OK, so. With this in mind, let's get into the model. Hope everybody's still with me. Okay. So I'm gonna use this. Let me, let me I don't know if you guys are seeing the floating meeting controls, um, but I'm removing them to make it easier. Hopefully that's easier for you guys. All right, so we're gonna use um, a map projection like this to integrate the results that we've been talking about. So we'll start with the very first time slice. So this is 30,000 to 24,000 years ago. Um, this was a warm period, a relatively wet period during marine isotope stage three. This was the last major interstadial. This is pre-LGM. During this period, we have the emergence of a new group of people that split off from East Asian, which are shown as AEA, shown in blue. I'm gonna keep these colors. Um, and we term these first Americans, and I'm showing them in red here. I suspect they were still admixing during this time period. So they're still a part of that AEA group. Um, this was not a quick split. It took place over 10,000 years. While at the same time, there was another group, ancient North Eurasians, and these stars represent the individuals that, that have these genomes. So Yana 1 and 2, Malta 1 versus AR33K and Tianyuan. These are, these are basal East Asians to give you guys, guys an idea of what we're talking about. Um, the group to the north is linked with the Siberian Middle Upper Paleolithic. And I'm going to show the archaeology as, as blue text. So this is the Middle Upper Paleolithic um, that we're talking about. And it's really centered on southern Siberia around Lake Baikal. You can see Lake Baikal here. They tend to be there the whole time they're there as a population. So it looks like what happened is during the warmest period of the last Inner Stadium, people expanded up the Lena. This is the Lena River here. Expanded up to about the Yana area, and that's as far north as they got. We know that the area was depopulated later, so humans did pretty good during that time period. Um, we don't have any admixture with this group with FAM, so we suspect that that's why they're going to be down pretty much in what's known as the trans Baikal area. Now, what do we have in the Americas? Well, we have Chikwahita Cave. Um, I don't know if you guys have talked about it much, but we, my co-authors and I did put out a publication uh, maybe two years ago where really this material looks like uh, geofacts. These, these are cave spall artifacts made of the same limestone as the, the cave itself. Um, we're not convinced that's a real site. Um, Hartley Mammoth, um, the few lithic debitage or flakes that have been found there have not been linked whatsoever with the dated mammoth remains. So that's entirely unequivocal. And then you guys may have heard of the paleofecal study um, of two lakes, Barrow Lake and E5 up in, in my neck of the woods. And we, we are not strongly um, convinced of this in the far north. And we can, we can talk briefly about it. Um, so here, again, not to get too technical, the idea was that there is an assumption that you do a lake read, you do some lake cores, you get copper stanols, which are related to feces. Sorry, yuck, a little bit of this uh, today. Um, but there are some biomarkers that coprostanols could suggest human presence. And so you're looking at thousands of years before present. And Bachela and others are arguing for, look, there's lots of people here 30, 25, 20,000 years ago um, at these lake sites. The problem is they this is experimental. They haven't controlled for this yet. They, they didn't test other omnivores, carnivores. So these could be bare for all we know. Um, and the few studies that have had control show there's wide overlap between humans and non-human carnivores. So it's, it's not helpful. 
The other thing is we have better proxies like radiocarbon dated components, and it doesn't match at all. So not only do we not see that early record, but we also have a very clear Holocene record um, that's not replicated at all. So it doesn't match. So we're unconvinced that's a real site. We suspect it's uninhabited uh, at that point. Okay, moving on to the LGM. So white are glaciers. So you can see the big glaciers, uh, Laurentide and the Cordilleran that are basically separating Beringia, which is here, from basically what we call the lower 48 up in Alaska. So basically the North America south of the ice sheets. And also you can see that because of the land bridge shown as um, the, the land above uh, modern sea level, you can see that there's basically a subcontinent that we are essentially Asian. The area that I work at, we find very Asian sort of materials. We're, we're connected to the old world. All right, so between 25 and 20,000, we've got a number of important events. The location of A&E groups in Cisbicol remains constant. We've got Malta 1 still there, as well as later off on Tava Gara 2 and 3. The East Asian groups continue to be here. We've got 33,000 and 19,000 year old individuals, and they don't appear anywhere different than these areas. So we, we feel that they're staying there. Um, and we also have a deep population in the far north. So I wrote uninhabited here. And, and the Yana folks are gone. They're long gone. And the reason is pretty clear. This is the last glacial maximum. It, the regional climate was very cold, very arid. And it appears that hunter-gatherers contracted to the south. Um, this is going to cause people to congregate in different refugia, which is going to isolate them and essentially facilitate genetic dispergence. And that's what we see. Um, so we see the, the FAM are still there, and we see the emergence of a brand new group of people called uh, ancient paleo Siberians, shown here in yellow. And they are admixing with ancient North Eurasians during this time period. So this is where I think we have good evidence that Native Americans are hanging out. They are admixing with this, this green ancient North Eurasian group. Now, two sites in the Americas may date to this time period. Um, Bluefish Caves, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I talked with a few folks earlier uh, before we got online uh, or before the, the, the talk started. Um, we're dealing with basically fauna that are from carnivore-derived assemblages that may have marks that could be cut marks. It could also be uh, uh, cryoturbation marks, so freeze-thaw or, or movement, colluvial movement within the cave. It's not but the few lithics that we have are clearly the Nali com complex. This will be much later, early Holocene materials, um, and, and it, we're not convinced. However, White Sands is a different story. White Sands, New Mexico, some of you may be familiar with the site um, where we've got footprints. Uh, some of my colleagues, like Dan Otis, are involved in that work. Um, it suggests that we do have humans in, say, that area, by 23,000 and perhaps even earlier because they would have had to come through before the ice uh, closed. Um, and there was no coastal route available at that time either. So it's it's unclear. Um, these don't seem to be related to Native Americans. If we, if we had to guess which group of people that represented, I'll have to go back a couple of slides, bear with me. It would be perhaps these ancient North Eurasians continued over uh, that far south before the ice closed during uh, LGM. That's a that's a possibility if, if White Sands turns out to be a legitimate site. Um, there's still debate, keep in mind. Okay, so this period, um, the latter part of the standstill period is probably the most contentious period. Um, notice all of the question marks. Where are the first Americans during this period? Um, all that's required genetically is that we be isolated from wherever the East Asian populations are. That's it. So there's many places they could have been. Uh, John Hoffecker has argued, well, maybe uh, in 2016, he argued they're on the southern coast of Beringia. Uh, this last year, he's argued they're in the northern coast, the northern Asian Arctic Ocean coast. Uh, Ian Bouvet has argued that they're in basically northern Japan, so Sakhalin, Hokkaido area. Um, Eski Villerseps thinks they're already in the Americas. Um, I suspect that they're actually here for a number of reasons. The most plausible location is in Transbaikal because we have continued anchor points um, in the region. So AEA is firmly to the south. Afatova Gara 2 and 3, you can see up here, shows that A and E are still persistent in the same region. So nobody's moving in, in essence. 
Um, but most critically, we've got the closest relatives. This is Kygros 1, which dates to exactly the time period we're interested in. And basically, he's in the Lena Basin. Then a few years later, we're going to find UKY in the southern south of Lake Baikal, really establishing the closest relatives of Native Americans are still in this region. So it, it suggests that, um, that uh, Native Americans are as well. Also, a quick note, um, we've got the earliest diversification within Native Americans, or first Americans, and I'm noting this as AB. So ancient Beringians have split off, or they're beginning to split off somewhere around this time frame. And when we look at the material culture, uh, the Dioktai uh, complex is, um, in essence, the only game in town. There is only the Dioktai complex or Dioktai culture as a group that's clearly expanding from southern Siberia to the north, and we actually find them in Alaska. So it matches our expectations pretty well. So during the LGM, it does not make sense for you to be expanding northward, but it does make sense during the deglaciation. I think this is where we've got an expansion sometime after 16,000. And you notice my 2,000 year wiggle room. This is to make everybody happy. So this, at some point, Within this time frame is when we have this expansion uh, into Beringia and into um, the America South ice sheets. Tracks with our archaeological data really well. Um, we can see these microblade technology. This is the Ubetsu kind of technology, uh, Ubetsu microblade cords, which we find in Swan Point, the, the earliest bona fide unequivocal site in Alaska at around 14,200. And we see them quite commonly in the Dukai region. Um, so the most plausible time frame for them coming into the Americas, if you want to be to get a little bit more precise, is probably between 15,300 and 14,300. And this matches that wide DNA span, which is a little bit uh, a little bit uh, better quality, um, a little bit more precise. So we have the SNA NNA group expanding first. Why? Because they continued south, and then the ancient Beringians came second. And they persisted. You can see them still hanging out in Beringia, at least by this time period. Now, we have to have a mechanism to explain why SNA and NNA groups split. They split about a, a thousand year millennia before Clovis. Um, the constricted geographic quarters of the ice free quarter in the Pacific Northwest coast really do provide excellent boundary mechanisms for these groups. And I think both. Sorry to give you the, the, the scuttlebutt here. Uh, I think both routes, the coastal route and the interior route, were both used by about the same time, but by different groups. The primary difference is that the coastal route was used by NNA ancestors who really stayed put. They liked the area. They were really well adapted to it. And they didn't really get further south than Puget Sound, whereas the SNA group really continued south and expanded across the rest of the Americas. And this really will fit into the anchor points that we're going to get a few uh, hundred years later. And this is our first anchor. This is the Anzic child from Montana, clearly a part of Clovis. And hopefully you guys can see the Anzic child right here, Montana. Um, clearly part of Clovis and also part of SNA. And this SNA led to all Native American groups south of the ice sheets, um, except again for very few groups in the very far north. The earliest Clovis sites date between maybe 13,000 years ago, maybe 13,500, depend on which dates you include. The spread of SNA was rapid and star-like, consistent with the rapid migration of a single population moving through largely unpopulated areas with early diversification into many, many sublet agents. I'm not gonna show all that here, but basically SNA split into many, many different subgroups within SNA. All that matters to us is that it's just SNA, a variant. Um, divergence is somewhere in that 14 to 13,000 year range. I suspect it happened around 14,000 years ago or so. Then the ancient Beringians are coming in a little bit later, and we have the first links. You can see the, the triangles here. We're going to have, yep, I hear an echo. Am I good? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so the triangles are represent uh, archaeological sites, and Urez 22. And this East Beringia and Swan Point are both Ubetsu uh, archaeology, uh, microblade core technology, that probably represent, I suspect, these SNA groups coming through really rapidly. 
because there's a gap. And so after that gap, around 13,500 years ago, you'd see this kind of technology. We call this Chindadan. We see it in Nikita Lake around 138, and we see it at Chindadan sites in the areas that I work in, and I work on a number of Chindadan, where these distinctive teardrop-shaped points are very distinctive. Um, and of course, Anzic is representing by Clovis very different kinds of technology. So there's probably a very rapid, probably a, a founder's effect or, or bottleneck effect um, happening where you've got some different technologies emerging as people deal with different kinds of gray species south of the ice. Um, but this gives you an idea of around 14.4 in Siberia. We see it at 14.2 in Alaska. A little bit later, we see a gap 13.8 at Nikita Lake. And then around 13,300 or so, we see that in Alaska. So these are probably little, you know, faint tr traces of these very earliest populations moving across. So these guys, uh, Chingadan, didn't go further south. Okay, now this map, I'm very, very happy with because there are tons of stars. There are stars everywhere. This is why I've developed the model, the preceding model, the way that I did, because this is a really firm set of data for where people are about 12,000 to 9,000 years ago. We have a number of different groups. First off, we can say that we've got a very new game in town up here. Notice this yellow group, this Paleo Siberian group is expanding at the expense of Native American ancestors that would have still been in Asia at the time. So Kolyma 1 is, is associated with this group, Zumnagin group. So remember the wedge core technology we've talked about before. That's with the red ancient Beringian folks. We see it replaced by a hyperconical or conoidal or pencil-shaped microblade core group. Very different technology. They lose a lot of the bifaces as well. So very different group is basically replacing them in Asia. And I can show it to you here. So here's Jyuktai up at the top. Right. Lots of uh, bifaces. Uh, we find this in Alaska, no problem. Some burins, wedge shaped microblade technology, these nice microblades. And then around 12,000 years ago, they're, they're, um, basically Denali is replaced, or Dukai is replaced by Sumnagin. So bifaces nearly gone, very different kinds of burins, multihedral burins, very, very distinct. And these conical kinds of cores. And you notice later in the Siberian records, really well known from Sealac to Belkachi, we talked talk, it continues. Basically, these Paleo Siberians continue in Asia, whereas the first Americans are gone. And so the question is, are there any cousins? And the answer is no, they're, they're gone quite early on. So let me back up a little bit. Um, so we've got those three major groups, ancient Beringians. We find them at the sites I work on, like USR 1 and 2. We've got two female infants. Cherokee Cave, clearly the widespread Denali complex uh, is associated with these populations. We've got the very earliest NNA individual at Chukaka on the coast, um, 10,000 years old. And every ancient remain we find on the coast, basically the BC coast, British Columbia, is connected to the Chukaka and also modern groups. So this NNA group is definitely coastal and they're really early. And then as far as the folks further south, Spirit Cave, definitely not Clovis, uh, Mayahaka uh, Peck in Belize, Clearly not Clovis, but they're all related. They're all SNA sublinear. So everybody south of the ice is SNA. And this is probably the boundary because Kennewick is going to be SNA, Kennewick here in Washington, but it does have some NNA admixtures. This is a good boundary for where that gap would likely have been. And when we move to uh, 9,000, 6,000 years ago, the again, basically, Indian Paleo type. Uh, Paleo Siberians are pretty much ruling the roost in most of Northeast Asia. Ancient Bringians are still here in the far north. Uh, NNA begin as soon as the ice melts, they're going to begin to expand across Canada, basically from west to east. And we're going to find them around the Great Lakes maybe 4,000 years ago. And again, more and more individuals uh, south of the ice, all SNA. I think we have about 20 individuals in South America, which are part of this. And Kennewick gives you that boundary condition between. Uh, between hopefully i'm not going too fast hopefully the maps are helping okay um so at some point i just leave this map up here at some point there is admixture from some paleo siberian group into Dene people which are probably going to be somewhere in this neck of the woods here Dene are northern native america they're not ancient bridge as far as we can tell and we don't know when it happened um, but somewhere during the early Holocene, there was another expansion. We can't track that with the archaeology. So 
but we're probably missing something um, at this point. But as I said, I'd show you where it matches and where we don't have such great data. All right, around 6,000 years ago, major things are happening. Ancient Beringians have now basically been replaced or absorbed by people coming to the north. And we, we term them Northern Archaic, making very different kinds of technology like the Shield Archaic uh, side knot point. But these are probably Athabascan ancestors moving into this region and they persist to this day. So they've been there the last 6,000 years at least. And you can see the spread of NNA across with the Shield Archaic present in ancient Southwest Ontario uh, individuals uh, by 4,000 years ago. And then to wrap out the model, we have the most recent spread, which is this Paleo Inuit related group in yellow, which expanded basically from the Bering Strait. We see them as Arctic small tool tradition, expanding all the way to Greenland, and we've got their DNA in Sakak. It was very earliest individuals. Um, later groups like 302, 443 continued Northern Native American in that region. And that takes us to basically nearly the modern day. Um, most recently, of course, we've got expansions of uh, Navajo and Apache, which would be NNA groups coming to the further south, Southwest. Um, this takes us so, to the sort of the, the modern day. And what I want to do next is to shift to what can we say about these sort of the ancestors to uh, the first Americans where they moved to the South. And that's really what I've been involved with, um, with the work that I do. So this is scale, uh, you know, 100 kilometers here. So quite a quite a large area in the Tanana River Valley. Uh, Fairbanks is up here. If you kind of follow it up, it'll be kind of up here. Um, so quite a few deeply buried stratified sites. I think we're up to maybe... Uh, 120 Ice Age components, so a lot of sites. Um, so Gripsal River, for instance, has seven components. Broken Mammoth has about uh, nine. Um, so these are some of the sites that we're going to be talking about that we can develop uh, better data sets for looking at these. Here's glacial ice, you can see. So they're, they're very paraglacial. Um, they're, they're right next to these um, um, ice complexes. And so what you're seeing in, in cross-hatching are the bottomlands, so interior bottomlands. There wouldn't have been forests yet. Um, these would have been sort of shrub tundra, maybe some birch, uh, maybe some poplar, uh, but the spruce hadn't invaded yet. So this is the time frame. We also know that economic strategies focused on bison and elk or wapiti. Um, a little bit earlier on, you know, they're hunting mammoth, but by the time we really see them getting going, bison and elk are their mainstays. And it really facilitates their movement east and west across these uh, rivers. Um, both Chindadin and Denali complexes are using the same technology, the same kind of lifeways. And collectively, we can paint with a broad brush the way that they lived in these far northern uh, surroundings as hunter gatherers, help guide us um, to look at their adaptive story. So, most sites are going to look like this. And this is an actual rigorous reconstruction of myself and illustrator Eric Carlson for one of those sites. This is Gersel River around 10,000, 11,000 years ago. Um, you know, the actual activity areas, what they were doing around each of the hearths, uh, rigorously reconstructed. But most of them are logistically organized hunting camps like this. They're on bluff tops, they're overlooking rivers. Um, large game like bison and elk would be brought to the site. You can see a central uh, area here where they, they'd be dismembered further, disarticulated, taken to these various other areas to be processed for marrow and then moving the, the high meat yield uh, areas or, or elements um, off-site onto residential base camps. So we're really getting one part of the puzzle here. And I want to highlight that we do have high facial hunting weapons like this, but we also have composite hunting weapons like this. So these are, this is a bone uh, or antler composite point. And you can see microblades have been inset along the edge of this, a little razor blades, particularly. And we know that they're preferentially going after the large game with these kinds of weapons. So these are the kind of weapons that we find uh, in the very far north. Or rarely, we encounter residential sun. And this is a rigorous reconstruction of Upward Sun River. This is a, a residential base camp where we know there were men, women, and children. Um, including a burial of three individuals. Um, USR is dating to around the Younger Dryas period. Um, we've recovered two neonates and a three-year-old um, that were that died during the summer, so which is a summer camp. 
where we know they're going after, they were bringing in uh, game like bison and elk. We can see people coming from that last camp we just, saw, we just showed you, coming into this particular camp. We know they had basically a temporary hide uh, tents, willow frame, probably uh, hide uh, tent structures. There were at least three of them at the site. Uh, the burial was found actually in this one right here. Uh, a number of different other things. Some, some of those with eagle eyes can pick out salmon processing. We know that they were going after salmon. Some of the earliest evidence of salmon fishing in all of the Americas was at this site. It goes back over uh, 12,000 years old. We have um, another element um, from the diets of these individuals I'll talk about in a little bit, but basically this gives you a picture of highly residentially mobile hunter-gatherers, mainly terrestrial in organization, going after a wide range of large game, small game, fish. Uh, there's a lot of waterfowl that are in some of these sites as well. Um, highly mobile and mainly using riverine systems. About 90% of the earliest sites, Ice Age sites in Northwest North America are in the interior along these big river systems. So in uh, just a couple of years ago, we published the very first direct analysis of paleo diet for a paleo Indian individual. In this case, we're dealing with the two infants. Um, so here we've got the mothers of USR and USR uh, 1 and 2 using stable isotope analyses. So this just shows you really quickly carbon and nitrogen. Here's the diets right here. And it's basically Euclidean space. So this is made up of bison, green, wapiti, and blue. You can see small mammal further away. Very far away is whitefish. And then we've got salmon, the only thing that's going to be pulling it in that direction. And so from that, we can actually generate the diets of the mothers. So we've got terrestrial diets around 65%. Over 30% was from salmon because this is a summer campsite. And about 10% freshwater species, whitefish. So even though they're encompassing a wide niche, a wide diversity of, of, of uh, our animals, we do know that they were a mixed um, uh, foraging strategies, central place foraging and logistical foraging for megafauna that are that are common in the area. And we also, one of my students did a macrofossil study. They were also eating a lot of plants, so bearberry, blueberry, lagoonberry, and sink were some of the, the plants uh, in the diet. Really, really cool. So we have multiple sites. We know that they were present every single season, including winter. We have one of those rare winter sites basically based on a bison um, jawbone, it's a juvenile mandible. So they were able to sustain themselves year round in these paraglacial conditions. And again, this goes back to 14,000 years ago, long before we see Clovis. When we look at other, uh, so a, a broader diet breadth um, study, this was a study I did back in 2008, we see an interesting trend. So what you're looking at here is percent of sites that contain these taxa. So during the bowling alaris, this would be 14,000 to around uh, uh, 13,000 years ago, you see 25% of the site contained mammoth, a little bit less contained horse, a bunch contained bison. In orange, you see the younger driest components. So broadly, you can see a similar kind of suite of large game use, right? Bison and elk predominantly. We lose mammoth and horse. These are probably very earliest uh, sort of uses, but they drop out during the younger driest. And what you also see is during times of stress, they really went after more and more small game. We hear, we've got ground squirrel, marmot, and beaver. So it's a really nice record of a very flexible strategy that could allow you to go into a new area and expand your diet breath as needed if you undergo resource stress. This gives us a picture of a very flexible, a very generalist kind of an approach, exactly what we'd expect to see from, from some of the first departments. And we can also um, we can also look at burials. Um, we have insights into so two of the very earliest burials in the Americas. Some of you are familiar with uh, Clovis burial at Anzic. Uh, so this is that 18 month old uh, individual that was buried with all of these items, including uh, bibevel bone rods, which had been interpreted to be four chats. And then we have this ancient Beringian burial that I excavated. Um, this is pretty extraordinary. I don't know if you can quite make it out, but these are very large. Um, we know they're elk antler, 
four shafts. They're bi-beveled, so they're beveled on both ends. So this would be attached to a dart, a javelin dart, basically. Uh, and this would be attached to the points. And two of the points were actually in articulation. They were buried in the two children hafted. So these are some of the earliest hafted bifaces. Well, I think they are the earliest hafted bifaces in the Americas. And this is the portion that we're talking about. Now, this is really intriguing that both in both cases, these are large mammal hunting weapon technology, projectile point technology, organics that were basically uh, sacrificed, that basically interred with the, uh, with the buried children. I think this yields important insights into Paleo-Indian ideology, even though we know there's a broad spectrum of diet, and even though they, they were fishing, uh, they were fouling, uh, they're going after geese and, and swans. Even with that, what they felt most important that should be put in these graves would be large mammal weapon systems. I think this gives us a sense um, of sort of the ideology that th this was a, a way that you could move into new areas if you figured out how to adapt to bison hunting or mammoth hunting. That, that large mammal could blast through biotic barriers. It can move large distances. We know in the late Pleistocene, we had a very similar Arctic step, basically a step tundra that, that persisted from Spain across Eurasia into Beringia and into basically the Northern Plains, same kind of a landscape. So when people figured out how to hunt these animals, you could move into very new territory without changing your citizen strategy that much. And it appears that that's what they did. So we, I want to sort of final or finish the 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 uh, sort of our journey today with talking about these different routes that they may have taken more locally, and I want to sort of pin this idea of an interior route. You can see it here between the Laurentide and the Cordilleran ice sheets, and a coastal route that would have followed the southern Beringian coast. The Aleutian Islands are here, Alaska Peninsula. This is Kodiak across the Gulf of Alaska into the Alexander Archipelago and then further south. But I want to stress that once you're in Seattle right, or northern Montana, it doesn't matter. Any evidence on the coast south of this doesn't get to play into it, right? Because you easily could have people hanging out in northern Montana that expanded to the coast in Washington or Oregon and moved south. So this is the time period we're looking at. So one of the things we did a few years back was to, you know, we don't have the underwater archaeology, right? That, that, that's always been portrayed as a problem. But what we do have are obsidian sources. And so what I wanted to take you through is a, a test that I did for the very, this is only talking about the very earliest materials. So all these triangles represent known obsidian sources. We've got coastal ones here, and we've got deep interior ones, some that would have been covered with ice, and some of that were always deglaciated, always available. Keep in mind, these were never below sea level. So those have always been available to people during the time period we're talking about. So what would a coastal migration look like? Well, first we'd expect the first obsidian used to be basically coastal obsidian, and it should be east-west long distances, right? Second, only then would we expect people to be moving into in uh, intermediate valleys like the Copper River, the Cuscoquit, or the Sisseton. And lastly, only lastly, should we see the deep interior be utilized. So this is the expectation for a coastal, a first coastal migration. And here I'm talking about SNA, like what, what route did SNA? Do? The interior migration looks different. The very first should be the interior obsidian should be exploited first. It should be east-west, not north-south. And second, we should see them moving into the intermediate basins. And only lastly, should we see them moving on the coast. And the coast should look popped up, distinctive. In other words, the people using this obsidian would only be here. The people using BC obsidian should only be here because they're coming from the coast. So with that in mind, we performed a test. We looked at all of the obsidian prior to 13,000 years ago, which is pre-Clovis, and older than 10,000 years ago to, to increase the sample size. Here is all of the dated sites that are older than 13,000 13, years ago. And we've got quite a few. There, there's a number of them in the interior. 
Uh, Wally's Beach is the only one that shows up on this map. There's no coastal ones that are that old. Uh, the coastal sites start popping up around 12,600 to give you guys a sense of sort of the scale of, of scope. And what we see is that there's red lines connecting, in essence, Wiki Peak with a number of early sites. And here's Batsapena, also connecting the materials with where the materials came from. So again, it's matching this interior expectation. They're averaging you know, 600 kilometers. These are really long movements of obsidian. It's all east-west. And we actually see it in some of the very earliest sites, like Swan Point is right here. And we see obsidian very, very early at 14,200. So they already knew where the obsidian was, even at that early time period. When we expand it to a little bit later in time, we start seeing coastal sites using obsidian. Uh, there's quite a few uh, coastal sites around 12,000 years ago. You can see here, uh, some famous ones along Haida Gwaii. And really, we, we see them using some coastal obsidian. This is Obsidian Cove right here. Um, but also, they're using interior, like mounted sides of obsidian. So they're, they're not exclusively using coastal obsidian. And it's very localized. Note, Akmak and Akaten never were used at this early period. We only see them picked up around 8,000 years ago, much, much later. In time. And this is after the, the sea levels established themselves. So really don't see a lot of evidence. And most, most archaeologists in the north, we don't see a lot of evidence for people expanding in this region. But it's a later phenomenon. Now, that doesn't rule out there could be people that are really early along this neck of the woods. And, and I'll try to highlight what I think is happening. So this was a, uh, a paper we published a few years back that kind of puts all the data points together so we can really look at them. And so, sorry, it's a busy slide, but we'll kind of walk through it. The red show these very earliest sites. The yellow show the sites between 13,000 and 10,000 years ago, uh, the various routes. And so the problem, you can see the ice is showing where the ice was at 14,800 based on um, a series of data that was published in 2014. Uh, there's a new reference that makes it a little bit larger. The problem is it's a moving target. Each of those black squares represent a geological sample, like a sediment sample, a biological sample, like a like a bone of an animal or a, a, a piece of a plant. All of it is showing that it's ice-free or already vegetated by somewhere between 16,000 and 13,300 years ago. And what you see is that there's a wide variety of basically open landscapes already. And so what you're seeing over here, these dotted lines are from OSL samples of sand dunes. So the sand dunes, when you're dating them, they have to be available, the sunlight's hitting them, right? So they're not under ice and they're not underwater. So these are uh, sand dunes that are, that are on uh, basically unglaciated surfaces. So this is the distribution of what the ice recorder probably looked like 15,000 years ago, much wider than we're estimated based on, say, beryllium of erratics or that sort of thing. And by the time you got Clovis around here, it, it's basically, it's not a corridor anymore. It's it's a wide open space. That. Um, uh, Jack Ives back in 2013 uh, this purple line shows the distribution of fl northern fluted points. And you can see it matches really nicely um, a, an early distribution of, of ice, uh, ice free canoe. So I suspect, um, my co authors agree that both routes are used. Um, but they would have been available around the same time, somewhere around 15,000, maybe 14,800, which, if you remember with the genetic data, that's perfectly fine. Um, with an expansion at that period. And I think it actually makes sense because people would be likely to expand as it opens up because you're going to get early successional vegetation, right? The, the early species are going to be grasses. Who likes grasses? Well, mammoth, horse, bison, they like grasses. And I suspect that that's some of the early um, animals that they're tracking moving through that area. Now, I do think there were early people moving along the northwest coast, and I think these are in a population. And there's a pass right here, White Mountain Pass, that we know is deglaciated somewhere around 13,000 years ago. I suspect that that's when we see this influx of people moving south. We've got these guys going through the pass, expanding into the Alexander Archipelago quite early on. Um, and I think they basically become isolated from 
the SNA groups moving through the corridor and the ancient Beringians which are still hanging out in Alaska. And basically that's why we see that tripartite distribution of genes. Now, as far as the rest of the coast, this is mainly for, for those of you that are interested in sort of how difficult it is to live up here. For this time period, we don't see any archeology span before eight or 9,000 years ago. Um, it's very difficult to make a living. We know there's seasonal ice, sea ice, there's drift ice. Um, this is dangerous, it's, it's quite dangerous. Um, I've actually worked out at Diomed Island, which is way out here. It's actually, you can see Russia, believe it or not, from Alaska. So there are two islands at the International Date Line. Little Diomed is right here, Big Diomed is right next to it. And I was asked, hey, do you wanna go on this open 14 foot skiff over to the mainland? And I said, no, thank you. Um, it was quite choppy, quite heavy seas, and that was in the summer. So imagine grinding sea ice and open leads and all sorts of other things. You really need highly sophisticated technology to, to mitigate that. You need skin boats, umiaks, kayaks. You need harpoon heads. You need toggling harpoon heads that when they embed in an animal, they toggle. You got lines running after them. So you can essentially capture seals, walrus, later whale. This is very sophisticated technology to innovate. And we know when it's innovated. And it's basically post 4,000 years ago. It's a late innovation. We really would expect to see that kind of technology if people were hanging out on the Southern Beringian coast. And, and it doesn't appear that they would. So that's, that's I think, our sense of the routes. Um, I'm definitely eager to entertain questions about the models. Um, broadly, I think we can characterize climate change as being the main reason why we see people moving when we do. There was that brief uh, movement north around 30,000 years ago during a warm period where we see Yana, the very far north. Maybe white sands could be related to this. But when LGM conditions came down, people contracted to the south. They split into different groups, including ancient Beringians, the first Americans, the ancient Paleo-Siberians. We see a deglaciation, a, a warming trend. What's really interesting, it's not just humans that move north, moose also move north at exactly the same time. Moose like warmer, wetter conditions. They like woody plants. So we see an emergence of a, a biogeographic expansion of modern humans moving to the north, associated with microblade technology, geotech technology. They come into Alaska, we see them around 14,200. I suspect around 15,000 is when they're there first. We see um, terrestrial adaptations emerging in Beringia, and then dispersal south through at least two different routes, northern coast by the NNA, the, the southern uh, SNA groups through the Ice-Free Corridor, and then expansions throughout the rest of the Americas in very exciting and interesting ways that we simply don't have time to talk about tonight. Um, and I think this story is a really fascinating one that, that there's a number of different sciences that are bringing different kinds of techniques, different kinds of data that seem to be coalescing in really strong ways. Um, and if, if, if you if prompted, I can talk about what I think about the 14,500 year sort of sites like Page Ladson, uh, Galt, you know, those sort of sites. I think they, they could easily be Clovis predecessors or antecessors. I think there's no problem with that. We'd expect a period of archeological invisibility because these are really small groups of people at the beginning and they're gonna expand and we're gonna see them at some point, but it won't be the very first. It will be you know, their grand, grand, grandchildren that we're probably gonna be picking up. And so uh, I wanna thank everyone for your attention tonight. Hopefully we covered a lot of ground, but hopefully there'll be really uh, interesting questions that, that we can talk about. Um, some of my funding, I'll just mention uh, National Science Foundation. I've had worked through Park Service and BLM over the years. Um, I published with uh, a great team, including geoarchaeologists, uh, Josh Ruther, uh, Pedro Dye specialist, Karen Hoffman, uh, zooarchaeologist, uh, Holly McKinney, uh, um, isotope specialist, Matt Wooler, uh, along with a number of other groups. Um, I'd definitely like to thank my native um, indigenous collaborators, Healy Lake Tribal Council and the Tanama Chiefs Conference for their permissions to do a lot of the work that I've done, including destructive analysis, DNA analysis. And a number of you guys mentioned uh, field research. Um, I did many, many field schools and a, a ton of projects. And these are just some of the folks involved with that. I wanna thank uh, the field researchers who helped us 
over the years. Um, and I'm, yeah, thank you for your attention and I look forward to questions. Thank you. I, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. Have you been uh, involved in any underwater archaeology? Uh, tangentially. So I do work with people that have done that, and I certainly um, maintain a focus on the results. Uh, people like uh, um, uh, like Leone, people like Ben Dixon, uh, John Erlinson. Uh, there's a number of folks that are interested in the stuff that that continue to do it. Um, if the question is leading into what's the best evidence we have, again, it's going to be around the 12,600 year old mark. Really don't have evidence for anything before that. Um, the weir, you guys may have heard of this submerged weir um, that made the news a, a bit ago. Uh, we don't have confirmation on that. We don't really have the peer-reviewed research that we need. Um, it's, that's kind of the issue is that people sometimes publish news junkets, uh, but we have to wait to see the actual peer-reviewed um, literature. For instance, there was one site that was interpreted to be a 14,000-year-old village along the Northwest coast. Um, I peer-reviewed an article that came out um, and what it ended up being was there was a village, but it was a, a 8,000 year old village. And there was a test pit that was maybe one test pit that went down deeper that found a piece of charcoal that may or may not be associated with three flakes. That's not a 14,000 year old village. That's a test pit with a few flakes that, that may date to that time period. That kind of gives you a sense of some of the issues. Yes, Nori. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm. I want to know more about the genetic database. Your n equals five twenty five. I want to know how many people, how many individuals do you have who are Panutian, Uto Aztecan, Hokan, or human? Yeah. So I had a slide. Um, I could bring it up. It may take a while. Um, unfortunately, very little. So the five twenty five is going to be Northeast Asian. Beringian and all of the Americas. That, that's the 525. Um, there's actually a paper in press right now that I can't cite, um, but they include even more. The problem is it's unequally distributed. So there's a, quite a range of South American samples, uh, a lot along the Andes. There's more coming out basically in, in Argentina, Chile area. But throughout much of the Americas, there's very little. Um, I'm going to... Yeah, I'm gonna share a screen with you guys um, for a slide I didn't show because I was trying to save, save space. Um, can you guys see that? Yes. Yes. So this, these are all of the ones older than 6,000 years of age in, in North America. You can see we don't have a ton. I mentioned all of them in the talk. Um, we have quite a few I'm going to stop sharing. We have quite a few um, modern individuals. Uh, this is less helpful because, again, modern doesn't tell us where they were sort of 10,000 years ago, right? Um, so I do think we do have a number of individuals that fall into the category you're talking about, Phoenician, um, but they would be modern um, Phoenician. They, they wouldn't be considered ancient. They would be modern people giving their uh, saliva or genetic, like a 23andMe kind of thing. Um, but I can tell you that we are woefully deficient in North American indigenous samples, particularly in the East. Um, a lot of this is historic, right? With with the horrible depopulation and and move re, forced removal uh, into into reservations and and sort of um, there, there have been a couple of studies looking at what genetic diversity we actually lost with sort of the diseases that came in post Columbian diseases. And it's on the order of like 90 to 95%, just populations dying from disease. Um, so yeah, to, to your question, it's woefully deficient. We need we need more. Um, I know from my own research, the Dene people, the Athabascan communities are really deficient too, because almost all the samples, and there's not that many, are coming from either Apache Navajo folks, which are the extreme outer edge, right, of, of a subgroup from Canada, or Chippewaian, which are also extreme outer edge near the Hudson Bay. So where we'd expect the most diversity is in Alaska, and we don't have ancient samples. 
We have, I was, I was involved in the paper where we published the only, the, the only three we have. And it was a, a three individuals that were in an accidental discovery that were maybe 900 years old. And that's it. Yeah, John. I think you're still here. Yeah, I got it. Okay, I had a question about um, there is a, a some linguistic uh, proposal that that there are people in Yenisei River uh, who are related to the Nadine folks. Right. And do you do you have any kind of archaeogenetic perspective on that? Yes, I do. Um, actually, we we published. Um, a piece, I, it's not out yet, but with Ed Vida, who was the linguist that came up with this hypothesis. Um, and, and okay, I should tell you guys this right now. If you do searches for this, there is a, how to say it nicely, there's a community of people that are really interested in connecting people from really far away. We we call them long rangers. It's like, you'll see, oh, the NSA and are connected to the Burachowski who are connected to the Etruscans in ancient Italy and all sorts yeah. of wild pseudoscientific stuff. So be aware that that's out there, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about legitimate linguist research. Um, so I think it's a very exciting piece of research um, because it's very, it tells us something about ourselves in terms of language. You guys realize Indo-European is the model that people use to look at how do languages change through time. We, we know that, right? Because we have Latin. We, have, we can we can look at through historical documents physically how these things are happening, how rapid they change. And they change rapidly, right? According to Indo-European. Problem is Indo-European are farmers, right? They're, they're huge demic mansions. Like when Indo-Europeans do things, we do it big, right? We have people that move. And we readily accept other Terms. Many people are the opposite, right? They're hunter gatherers, they're pedestrian hunter gatherers. They didn't domesticate the forest. They are very conservative in their tech in their technology and they don't like to borrow words at all. They they will when they uh, adopt corn, right? Corn is a big deal, maize is a big deal, but it's enemy food, right? It, it's it's a, it's clearly a different way of changing language through time. So the problem is this. Athabascan looks recent. The, the split within Tlingit, Eak, Athabascan looks maybe 2,000 years of time. The problem is to get them connected with Ket, you've got to go back thousands more years, at least 5,000, and maybe it could be going back 10,000 years. Okay? The very first people. This doesn't match like what we understand about how, how languages change, so it's a big problem. Right now, I think Ed, who is the originator of this, thinks that they're probably connected with the last major population movement we see, which is 6,000 years ago, that uh, ASTT, the Palo Inuit group. That doesn't make a lot of sense archaeologically because they never moved to the interior. They're connected with, we know, like Inuit and Yupik people, which are totally different languages, not even remotely the same. So it's, it's, it's a... I have to shrug my shoulders and we don't know. It's really exciting. We don't know what it means. We don't know when they could have shared that language. It could be as recent as 5,000 or as old as 14,000. Now, you know, also a uh, question I had. One of the talks that was given to the PCAS was Nathan Nakatsuka, you know, and we have a recent article that just came out in Nature in December. I don't know whether you saw that about ancient California that goes yeah. back to 7,800 years, yeah. individuals. Yep. Yeah. And they fit with and, your 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 map, actually, because they're, yeah. they're SNA. Yeah, yeah I, think that, that, that I think that what I want to get across to archaeologists is that we're used to always, oh, this is overturned because of this. This is overturned because of that. But that's not what's happening with the genetic data. It's actually doing what science is supposed to be doing. We're getting better and more refined but it's not overturning what we already do. It's, it's making it more rigorous, making it a little bit more um, complex. So yeah, I do remember the paper that, that came out. There was another recent one I didn't include on here, but the Northwest Coast, what? another like 2,300 year old individual, which again matches that long-term continuity. 
Um, so that's like really exciting uh, that it's not being overturned. But I suspect there's going to be a lot of new questions about within SNA breakup because there's a lot of complexity with different groups. Once SNA is there, then they're doing all sorts of interesting splits and that mixes. Thank you. Yeah. I see a, a question in the chat from Patricia Kingsley. Do you see that, Dr. Potter? Um, yeah, let me get the chat up. I hadn't had it on. Um, okay, so Meadowcroft. Is that, was that the first one, or did I miss an earlier one? Uh, it starts out oh. by saying the maps really helped. Okay, yep. Yep, here we go. Pulling down. Yeah, sorry for not sharing the screen early on, but hopefully it was just that, last, that early bit. So Chukakpa, um, it's so technically it is related to ANZIC because they're both Native Americans, but it's related at the FAM level. So to answer your question, it is related, but it's not, uh, Shukaka is not closely related. So FAM, then you had ancient Beringians split off, then you had North Native Americans and South Native Americans. ANZIC is a South Native American, Shukaka is a North Native American, so they're not closely related. They are First Americans. Hopefully that answers that question. I just talked to Jim um, about two or three weeks ago when he was up up there. He's doing good. Um, let's see, uh, haplogroups A through E. Okay, so um, I'm uh, I'm happy the Solutrian uh, hypothesis didn't come up um, yet because it normally comes up. There's absolutely no evidence and no reason to suspect that there was any kind of connection to Europe. I think you're whatsoever. Genetics is that's a slam dunk. No, there's there's no genetic evidence, and all of the genetic evidence is connecting it to uh, Northeast Asia, like the models that I'm I'm showing you. Um, the idea of a a movement across Oceania. So first of all, you can't explain the Y DNA, or sorry, the, the Y population that way. It, it doesn't work um, because it's not modern. Indonesians or modern Melanesians that we're talking about. We're talking about an ancient group. So it, it wouldn't, you know, the, the record we have for Polynesia is very, very clear. It's an expansion of Polynesians from basically Southern Taiwan. Uh, it's within the last few millennium and it would be way too late. Even if one of them made it all the way across to say South America, it, it wouldn't have any bearing on any of the populations we're talking about. So there's really even, it, it, it's possible some group may have made it there, one group of Polynesians. I wouldn't be surprised if they did because they're quite expansive seagoers. You know, they, they were able to navigate uh, you know, thousands of miles into new areas, but it has no bearing on the people in the Americas. Um, okay, next one, environmental DNA. Um, I have mixed feelings. Um, I actually have been involved. I was on the Peterson et al. paper from 2016, which was sort of the landmark paper. Um, and there, there were issues that I raised and a number of other people raised, mainly about the dating um, of the sediments. You, you really have to have firm dating on your sediments to, to really track the, the environmental DNA. Second, those are, I think that some of you are old enough to remember when we switched from sort of conventional radiocarbon dating to AMS. And one of the issues that was raised at the time is now we can date little tiny pieces of charcoal. And the question is, is where did that tiny piece come from? Did it move through the record? Did it slip in roots? Did it, was it pushed downward by you know, some uh, bioturbation or whatever? It's the same kind of thing with the molecules in DNA. We don't know how this stuff moves through sediment. Um, we do know that macrofossils easily can be moved through sediment. So the problem is, did the DNA come from exactly where you think it came from? And, and that's a taphonomic question. It's not a, it's not a genetics question. So I'm firmly in the camp of we need to be very, very cautious and careful about how we apply eDNA. Um, so to give you a sense of what we're doing. So the project that I'm on now, I've actually got bison that's 13,000 years old in situ getting the samples of DNA while we're going. So I collect bone sample. We know exactly what species that is, right? I then collect the sediment that is adhering to the bone then I go one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeters down, I collect more samples. That, that's going to be the only way to do it, the test. Do we get a bison DNA here? Does it degrade? Is it doing what we think it's supposed to be doing? 
and we don't have that data yet. We just have, you know, here's what we found uh, with the with the shotgun approach. So yeah, that's my long and short is it's there's potential for it, but um, it, it's not quite there yet. We need more controls. Uh, Metacroft. Okay, so I would encourage you guys. Um, there was a paper that we. Uh, so you remember the the Chicoahita cave, maybe the Mexican site, uh, arguing for really early people in in Mexico. Um, we wrote a response. We had about twenty senior colleagues that are specialists in lithic analysis, genetics, etc., and we basically went through the list of basically pre-LGM sites. So I'm not going to take any pot shots at sites that are less than sixteen thousand. I think some of them are, you know. May not be uh, unequivocal, but basically all of the ones that are pre-16, with the exception of White Sands, potentially, uh, I, I think don't. They're, they're not rigorous enough. And Metacroft is one of them. So like Metacroft, a number of issues. One, you've got um, huge errors, standard errors, uh, to the like plus or minus thousand years. We don't we throw those dates out. You, you simply don't use them. Um, that's a clear indication of contamination. We know there's lignite. We know there's dead coal. A carbon in the region, in the local area, you know, you need to date seeds. And as far as I know, Adavasio has never been willing to date the seeds. So until he does, you know, the, we don't know the age of the site. Um, and also more troubling is that it's really paraglacial. And so we'd expect to see some flora that is glacial age, like Pleistocene in age, but the flora that has been recovered looks tallest. So Metacroft, I think most archaeologists don't feel that Metacroft is a uh, is an unequivocal site. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, could it be a site? It could be. Uh, lots of things could be, but I, I don't think it, it uh, uh, there's not enough good evidence. Um, the Navajo and Apache, that's a, um, a long story, uh, one that I'm not a specialist on, but I can definitely point you in the right direction. So uh, Dak Ives, John W. Ives, is a professor in Alberta who's written extensively about uh, Athabascan migrations. Um, and, and has re written a new book recently on it. So I-V-E-S, I would definitely encourage you to, to check out his writing on that literature. Um, I, my understanding is it is interior. So it's moving south from basically the Alberta, Southern Alberta area into Montana and then further south to where they are now. And we can see this track in things like the Dismal River tradition. We even have cave sites where you have Athabascan style moccasins, very clearly made in Athabascan Northern styles that sort of track that movement south. So there's really, um, uh, really good evidence on on when that, uh, uh, when that's coming through. Hey, rupia seeds, um, rupia seeds. Uh, so, so when this came out, I can tell you that most specialists were not convinced. The dating because rupia is not what you would want to date white sands or you wouldn't want to date anything with mainly because it is a hydrophilic plant it grows in water and we know that it is susceptible to dissolved inorganic carbon it's what plants do in freshwater and furthermore we know that that genus has yielded offsets of upwards of seven thousand years in other words the plant's dating 7,000 years older than it actually is, simply because you're dating those dissolved inorganic carbons as well as the, the carbon-14 that's in it. Um, so that's like, it was a, like a non-starter. You need to date something else. So as soon as they yielded that, we implored them, you got to do something else. You, you have to date either terrestrial remains or OSL will be a better attempt, you know, optically simulated luminescence ages on the sediments. So... Um, I guess it was a few months ago, they came out with a new piece. <clears throat> I would say my feeling went from about a 20% acceptance. So in other words, not accepting it for to maybe like a 49, 50%. So I, I'm still on the fence. I think it's much better than it was. Um, what they did is they now have radiocarbon dates on terrestrial pollen. Still not the best thing because what you're doing is you're, you're, collecting aggregated samples of thousands of pollen grains and enough to actually generate a date. But I can say that the dates are roughly matching up with the rupia dates, which in and of itself is kind of an issue because there was a paper that came out also around the same time within that same uh, Apotero Lake Basin 
that showed that rubia was in fact systematically older than what, or younger than what the radiocarbon dates are saying. So the fact that they match so nicely is kind of troubling a little bit. Um, but the OSL date, which to my mind would have been better, is only below it. So we don't have OSL in the middle and above bracketing. That's what you need to say that it's actually within that time frame. So right now I say it's still the best pre-LGM site that we know about. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it could easily be a site. But what I hope to have shown you from this series is that it doesn't match the genetic data whatsoever. I mean, there's there's very little um, there's very little things that sort of match the expectations. Like if that is a legitimate site, it doesn't seem to have any bearing on the Native American genetic um, uh, uh, development through time. But, and it doesn't seem to leave any traces either. If there was a population that split off that early, this is before Native Americans was a group, right? These would be like East Asian or, or North Eurasians. We would see that in the later genetics, and we really don't. We don't see any kind of admixture with a very ancient group. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Potter. That that was an excellent talk. I'm going to be sending you this certificate of appreciation from our from our group. Thank and you. Want to thank you again for uh, your presentation tonight. Um, I want to announce yep. that next. Next nope. month, we're going to have Jared Mathis, um, a little more local to Orange County, California. The title of his talk is Relics and Tales of Molten Ranch. Um, I, I believe he's the, uh, the the director of the the Molten Museum down there. Hopefully, everybody can join us. And that's going to be on April 11th. And unless Joe, anybody... Joe, let me add to that. Um, okay. That speaker will be in person. At oh, the yeah. RWD community room, so all are appreciated. Like yeah, if you can if you can be in person, that would be a, a great support to the speaker and and one last question for our speaker. Could you yeah. please put up your lead slide? Sure. Share that real quickly. Yeah, let me could I ask a question too, please? Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, so when when you're talking about these people coming through, what kind of numbers is your guess? Are we talking hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands? Um, that's a very good question, and believe me, my colleagues and I. Well, let me let me put the title up there so that uh, there was a question. Somebody wanted that on the screen. There we go. Um, so that's a very good question and very difficult to get at. That's a very difficult question to answer. There have been estimates made. And for SNA, for instance, we're looking at numbers that in terms of after this bottleneck, in other words, you know, the very first sort of groups that are coming across would be on the order of around 200 to 2000, like an order of magnitude, somewhere around that number, which is really small. Right, we are talking about a bottleneck. This was not like a, a highway that you had just tons and tons of people. You had a very distinctive group that went over and then of course expanded dramatically. That, that's kind of the other question I have about you know ideas of very early sites is these are just like you and me, they're modern humans with brains just, just as developed as ours. And they, like gangbusters, they expanded and, and uh, you know filled the continent in a very quick amount of time. I find it unlikely that there would be a modern human group that would come over, you know, show up a tiny bit here, tiny bit there over a 10,000 year stretch and then disappear. That that doesn't strike me as the way humans behave. So we are talking about a small group that was the original, the, the original first American. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Potter. Back to you, yep, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I thank you again and I wish everybody, um, a good night and thank you for joining us and hopefully you can um, renew your membership to PCAS and we'll look forward to seeing everybody uh, next month on April 11th. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, everybody. Great talk. Thank you so much. Yes. Yep. Thanks.
Good job, Dr. Potter. Complicated subject, but you did hey. a great, great job. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I tried to, hopefully it wasn't too jargony. Yes. Everybody followed it. Yes. Awesome. A lot of detail on Siberian archaeology. Political relations aren't good, but apparently archaeologists get along. Yeah, it's unfortunate, though. I mean, they, they don't get invited in the way that they used to, these areas. All right, well, I'll say good night. Yep, take care. Good night, everybody.